Welcome to another weekend episode, just titled Arrows. This is Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. Many of you long-term collectors will remember Beckett Baseball Card Monthly, obviously, or you've seen it. I was obviously there, and I remember the decision, which was not an, a no-brainer, to put in Arrows into the price guide that would indicate uh, change from the previous month. So the first issue in November of 84 was obviously no arrows because it was the first, it, even though there had been uh, press guide books before that. And we went six issues before we got into putting in arrows. And there were uh, letters, phone calls, feedback from readers of the magazine. It was popular at a certain level. Obviously, it went on to greater popularity. But at that time, we got a lot of mail saying, hey, when cards go up, we want to know that they went up. Can you make some indication? We actually had to dig out. We had to create a special character because it's you don't find a triangle or an arrow on a standard keyboard of a computer or a typewriter. But we were on a computer in those days, and we had to create our own typesetting character, which I did because I think I've told you we had to create a kind of a special markup language so that the price guides could be uh, could go direct from uh, digital to um, the hard copy and be uh, actually pasted up in those days into the pages of the magazine. But uh, thanks, sponsors, Top Panini Upper Deck. Heritage Auctions, Hugging the Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, and ComC.com. Let's see. I think if you get out that number, that sixth issue of Beckett Baseball Card Monthly, April of 85, seems like ancient history, you flip to the owner's box and you'll see an explanation. Not a lot of fanfare, but on request, we did that. My concern, I was the holdup, as, as I was in many cases, I really didn't want to overhype we were a price guide, obviously trying to be as accurate as we could each month. But when the price had changed, we just changed up to that point. And dealers said, how do we know we're going to have to go through the whole price guide and compare from the previous edition, previous month to see what went up? That's sort of not fair. Fair or not fair, I listened to what they said. I thought on, on balance, yes, it, it would be helpful to put in some arrows. And then at a glance, you could see what sets or players were had movement. The, my desire was not to overhype, uh, which is not a bad desire. Uh, in those days, like now, there was uh, beginning to be uh, some heat in the hobby of things going up, uh, a little bit of a bull market, not as much as now. I wasn't putting in the percent of increase, but I was just indicating with an arrow whether something went up or down. And again, most things as now were going up. How much they went up, you'd have to look from the previous month. Now, that begs the question of uh, the, the tense of the verbs. And I see this today in a lot of the podcasts and uh, websites and and uh, apps. Uh, they're they're talking about what's going up. I strongly suggested that the arrows in the magazine meant that it went up from the previous month. Now, many times it went up again the following month. But be careful when you're looking at um, historical data that's not about the future, but about the past. You can see that something has gone up, whether it continues to go up is not. And again, I my my additional concern was we're doing arrows there, and then at the same time we're publishing a hot list, which is include which again is there's a past, present, and future aspect of the hot list. Just because something's hot one month, it may not be hot the next month. Now things don't always cool off as quickly, and when they heat up, they they can stay hot. That's probably more often the case, but. For as I said, it's I didn't want to hype things. I wanted the uh, cards to, uh, I wanted collectors to be able to have uh, interest in what they were collecting. And then as people moved on a certain card, the price would go up just because increased supply over constant demand. We had uh, printing deadlines for our editorial. I think I got into this with Rich on an episode in our magazines from the very earliest days, and especially after the magazine got a little thicker, we structured it so that the editorial deadlines were earlier than the price guide deadlines. So we had a chance to change prices even after the more slick editorial had uh, been printed. And so that th you could have a little bit of a disconnect between a hot list and an arrow pointing down or something like that. So the newsprint that we put the price guide on in those years was not just for um, to save money. It actually, uh, the newsprint printed faster uh, and I, as obviously cheaper because it's cheaper paper, but we could, since it printed faster, we could get another day or two before we needed uh, press time, and we could it would be printed on a different press actually. So again, it, it really allowed our price guides to be to me to be more timely. Now looking back after 35 years of uh, hindsight, 
I, I, I don't know that I need to make a reparations to dealers, but I do think that I now I, as I look back and I see that the difficulty that dealers had in adjusting their prices each month. Now, again, it's fun to mark your prices up, but I just remember Wayne Grove, my cohort at first base, and he had uh, his own pricing system, obviously, after I was uh, no longer a partner. But he had he had cards in five different places. He'd have them by the player, by the set, by the number, by the team, all kinds of different places. And the difficulty, if something had gone up from 30 cents to 50 cents, I, I'm not going to worry about that. And I don't think he did either. But if something goes from five bucks to 10 bucks in a month, which cards can easily do in season, going back and marking, changing the price is is tricky. Now we didn't do that. We didn't do arrows in the annual books that came out, the almanacs and the annual price guides, but we did in the magazines. And that was an arrow. The arrows were, once we put them in, they were there to stay. And so again, I, I think it was the right decision and it became part of our process. And it was allowed us to proofread in a way to see what had gone up and get a sense as the readers did, just our editorial staff and price guide staff as well. But now I look back and I just think, I don't like to ask what the price is. I don't like to ask if something has gone up. I just want to see the price and decide if I want to do it. And so uh, when I go to a card show now, that's why you see dollar boxes, because it's hard to move prices up and down. As long as they stay within a rough category, there may be some overpriced and some underpriced, and you just work it. Again, no substitute for knowledge, but again, the arrows still was a lot to digest when you went through the monthly price guide. And, and even if you just looked at the arrows, there were a lot of arrows. And again, the beauty of it, looking back, is most of them were going up. And if you were there at the time, that was uh, that was very accurate. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for uh, reminiscence about uh, arrows. Uh, I think there is some applicability today is that that arrow is something that went up and it might keep going up and it might not. So thanks, everybody. Be back again on Monday.